St. Paul, in our epistle lesson, says, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber. It used to be that farmers set the standards for the early wake-up call, you know, rising whenever the rooster crowed at sunup. But personally, from my experience, I don't think roosters crow at sunup. I mean, when we were at Hope Lodge in uh, Moswa in Tanzania there, this time-challenged rooster outside our window would crow at 4 o'clock in the morning, three hours before sunrise. But as the myth says, the rooster wakes up the farmer. He's the first alarm clock. Humans just don't seem to have been uh, created with an internal clock that gets us up at a certain time every morning. Um, and none of us usually have roosters in our backyards anymore that wake us up, so we have to depend on alarm clocks. Most of us use just a normal alarm clock, something like a, a clock radio or a cell phone or an alarm on our wristwatch. But other people may need some other iteration of alarm clock to wake them up. I mean, if you're one of those people who chronically sleep through your alarm clocks, or you're one of those chronic snooze pushers that say to yourself, oh, just five more minutes, that ends up being a half an hour later, then there are clo alarm clock solutions for you. I have five of them up here, actual alarm clocks that are on the market to help you get up quickly, so quickly that you might need an extra dose of blood pressure medicine. The first clock is called the puzzle clock. You remember that old game perfection, you know, where you had to put the pieces in the right slot at a certain time, otherwise the bottom would pop up and scatter the pieces all over the place? That's what this clock does. When it goes off, it scatters the pieces out, and it will not be shut off until you get the pieces and put them in the right shapes. Nothing says wake up in the morning to having to use your brain instantly and urgently. The second one is called the laser target alarm clock. This is my favorite. I mean, this morning routine combines sharpshooting with uh, waking up. When the alarm clock goes off, you have to grab the laser and it will not shut off until you hit the center of the target. And since Vicar says that's not a real sermon unless you have a Star Wars reference, well, Star Wars fans will love this one because it's the morning version of Han Solo blasting Greedo in the Mos Eisley Cantina. There you go, Vicar. <laughs> the third one is great for Harry Potter fans. It puts you in the middle of a Quidditch match each morning. The, when it goes off, a piece of the alarm clock goes flying in the air in which you have to catch it and it will not shut off until you place that back into the alarm clock. So, no word yet on how many points you score for this feat. Another one is called the wake and shake alarm clock. This alarm clock features a flat mouse that's placed under the pil pillow. When it goes off in the morning, it is so loud, it is five decibels away from a jackhammer. The fat mouse underneath the pillow shakes violently, and you can notice there's a strobe on top that starts flashing as well. I think wake and shake is a bit understated for the name of this alarm clock. And then finally there's one called clocky. This is for you snooze button pushers. If you push the snooze button on this alarm clock, it uses its wheels to launch itself off the nightstand, rolls around the floor until it finds a hiding place, and then starts blaring music once again, forcing you to get up out of bed to shut it off. Yeah, don't we all like an intense game of hide and seek before your first cup of coffee in the morning? But if you need any of these alarm clocks up here, chances are you're not a morning person. But whether you wake up fresh as a daisy every morning or you need some constant annoyance to get you out of bed, there is one, another kind of wake-up call that we all need to heed. 
And that's the spiritual kind. You have to imagine that St. Paul was a morning person because he just seems so organized and so driven by the urgency of the gospel. It's no wonder then that St. Paul wants fellow Christians to wake up and get to work as God's people. Paul urgently wants his, warns us that we need to wake up because a new dawn has broken and it's no use burning daylight. Alarm clocks track time chronologically, minute by minute, hour by hour, until it strikes the alarm. Paul, in our text, talks about a different kind of time. It's more talking about God's timing, particularly in relationship to Jesus coming again, the second advent of Jesus into the world, which is always the theme for the first Sunday in Advent. You see, Advent tells us to not only get ready, get prepared to celebrate the birth of Jesus, but always to be prepared for Jesus' second coming because you never know when God will call this world to an end. And the Greek word that Paul uses is kairos, which means a point in time. You know the time it is, says St. Paul. Unlike his fellow Greco-Roman contemporaries who thought that time and history were never-ending cycles, Paul views history in a linear fashion, in a straight line, leading up to a point, the second coming of Christ into this world. Paul believes that the church, including the church today, lives in two different ages at the same time. The present age, which is inaugurated by Jesus' first coming, his birth at Bethlehem, and which is still a world that has sin and brokenness in it, and then the age to come, which begins with, God, with Jesus' glorious return. For Paul, the first Easter was the new dawn. It was the sign that the new world was starting to break into this old world. It's no coincidence that Easter happened early in the morning on the first day of the week. While we would rather roll over and hit the snooze button and forget about work on the first day of the week, Paul reminds the church that because of the dawn of the new, new creation with the resurrection of Jesus, now, now is the time to wake up from our slumber. In the ancient world, sleep is often used as a metaphor for spiritual inattentiveness. And Jesus himself warned against spiritual snoozing uh, that he said, unless he finds his feckless followers asleep rather than working at his return. So Paul argues that the dawn has already broken in. Daylight is burning. He says, the night is far gone, the day is near, and salvation is nearer to us than when, we've, when we became believers. This salvation that he's talking about is both a present and a future reality. It is a present reality because through faith, the Holy Spirit has put us into a saving relationship with our God. It is yet a future reality because the perfect salvation, the wholeness of salvation, the complete salvation with the recreation of the world is yet to come. The kairos is getting short, says Paul. It's time to wake up. So what's one of the first things you do when you get up in the morning? Well, 
after you find and suppress Clocky and put him back on the nightstand, you're likely to cast off your PJs and take a shower and get yourself dressed for the day. Paul says we need to do the same thing spiritually. The new dawn of Christ's resurrection has broken in and exposed the deeds of darkness that we tend to hide. No wonder that the apostle urges us to, to lay aside that kind of spiritual clothing that only belongs in darkness, you know, wild parties, drunkenness, sexual promiscuity, jealousy, quarreling, backstabbing, hatred, malice, and the like. These things, he says, are not suitable in the light of Christ's new creation. Instead, Paul says, mixing metaphors here, he says, put on the armor of light. In other words, when you get up in the morning, prepare yourself to do battle with darkness. That darkness that would try to draw you back into a sleepy, self-centered way of sin. Begin each day, he says, begin each day with confession and repentance because, he says, that helps hold the darkness at bay and enables us then to live in the daylight of the power and glory of Christ's resurrection. Paul says that we are to clothe ourselves with our Lord Jesus Christ, a metaphor that he uses again in Colossians 3. But how do you do that? How do you put on Christ? Well, just as most mornings begin with a shower after casting off our clothes into the hamper, we begin each day remembering that we have been baptized, washed in the forgiving flood of our Lord Jesus Christ. In baptism, our old selves died with Christ so that in the resurrection of Christ, the new self can come forth and live the new life, a life suited for living in the light of God's creation. When we start the new day remembering our baptism, confessing our sins, taking on the character of Jesus in the presence of the Spirit, we can face the day wide awake and ready to work for the glory of Jesus and the good of our neighbor. We can live honorably, as St. Paul says, through the day as people who know that the dawn is breaking and the full brightness of Jesus is just on the horizon. You might be helped each morning by ritually including what is called the shower prayer. Have any of you heard of that? The shower prayer. It goes like this. Lord, as I enter the water to bathe, I remember my baptism. Wash me by your grace. Fill me with your spirit and renew my soul that I might live as your child today and honor you in all that I do. Sure, you'll probably wake up tomorrow morning and rub the sleep out of your eye and curse that annoying alarm clock again. But when your feet hit the floor, know that a new day brings with it the promise of a day closer to Christ and His kingdom. After all, it's Advent, the first Sunday of the new church year. It's time to wake up. And so may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.